Tonight, in a year of unprecedented climate impacts, a year the UN declared a code red for humanity, we showcase the best climate reporting around the world, inspiring stories of survival and resilience, investigative journalism holding power to account, eye-opening first-hand reports on our planet in crisis and how to save it. Nowhere will you get a better picture of the climate emergency, its solutions, and the best coverage of the most important story of our time. Covering Climate Now and the Columbia Journalism Review present the 2021 Covering Climate Now Journalism Awards. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us from Rockefeller Center in New York. I'm Al Roker. And I'm Savannah Sellers, and tonight we're thrilled to present the winners of these inaugural Covering Climate Now Journalism Awards. They not only represent outstanding reporting, they connect you with the people living the climate story and provide science-driven, solutions-focused coverage to meet the crisis facing humanity. We received almost 600 entries from 38 countries, dramatic firsthand accounts of a planet in pain, from crippling drought in the Western United States to deforestation in Estonia, to devastated koala populations in Eastern Australia, testaments to the way the climate emergency is affecting every region on Earth. This year, through record wildfires, floods, Hurricanes like Ida, the one I witnessed in New Orleans. We saw that this crisis is no longer a threat for the future, but as the UN Secretary General declared, a code red warning today. Now, our judges reveal the winning climate reporting that showcases that code red alarm. What is the sound of an iceberg melting? Our first winning story takes readers on a sensory journey to Antarctica. This year's award in the multimedia category, The Sound of Icebergs Melting, My Journey into the Antarctic, reported by Jonathan Watts for The Guardian. In this story, you have this really 360 degree view where you're like seeing pictures of the adorable little penguins and you're seeing, you know, footage of whales just really put you in that place. You are the winner. Oh, bloody hell. My goodness. Wow. I'm astonished. Jonathan's coverage captures both the drama of the changes that are happening there and the beauty of the place itself and the surrealness of the place itself. Climate change can feel really abstract and distant, and this made it personal. Traveling to the Antarctic has always been a dream of mine just because it's such a wondrous place and it has always sparked my imagination. In the Antarctic, it is a very different sensory environment. You don't really have anything to smell. There's not such a color range for your eyes. So maybe your sounds do carry further as well. The pilot cut the outboard engine to reduce noise while the scientist, Tim Lewis, dropped the hydrophone, essentially a waterproof microphone on a long cable, into the sea. Finally, a wry smile. I've never heard anything like it. Not what I expected at all, he said. It sounds like dripping, like the inside of a gorge. the sound of the icebergs melting. It was just kind of heartbreaking and weird and surprising and did something in sort of seconds that I think the written word has not really been able to accomplish. It, it wasn't water dripping down through the air. It was air being released up through the water. This was air that had been trapped for thousands of years. Then we started to think of the implications of that. And then, well, this is, Actually, this is one of the sounds of climate change. One of the hopeful things that really emerged from this trip was that humpback populations are recovering. And there is evidence from elsewhere that other populations of other species of whales are also recovering. And that isn't an accident. When humanity gets together and introduces a ban and regulates effectively, things can happen, change can happen. From ice to fire, through smoke and flames, 
Josh Edelson's photos for Augen's France Press provide a visceral experience of the power and scale of wildfires. Winning in the photography category, this is Heart of Fire. Wildfire coverage always makes a big impact because it looks like our idea of the apocalypse. We know that wildfires are an annual phenomenon and we know that they're getting worse every year. When you look at these photos, you see what that means. You see what the numbers actually translate to in terms of the destruction of people's homes, their lives and the forests. We've all seen photos of wildfires, but this was really the best of the best. He really just captured the sort of arc of, of a wildfire, I think, in a really, really compelling way. I've always been especially driven and moved by natural disasters and wildfires. Here in California, they're kind of right in my backyard. It's also very visually kind of spectacular. It can be both beautiful and also devastating, and it's just a testament to the times. You see everything from the burnt playground. I mean, this was a striking image a slide that had kind of just half burnt off in the flames. The image that stayed with me is the photo of a group of firefighters confronted by a wall of flames. You can see how small they are in the face of this fire and you see them grouped together whether they're about to retreat or whether they're about to try and tra tackle this blaze. Firefighters, they're really the heroes because they're out there putting their lives at risk and trying to save people. My job is to tell the story. Hi, my name is Katherine Hayhoe and I'm a climate scientist. We often think that the biggest problem that we have stopping us from acting on climate at the scale that we should is the gap between the people who say that climate change isn't real and the people who say it is. But in reality, the bigger gap we have is between people who say that climate change is real, but they don't think it affects them. How do we narrow that gap? By talking about it. Talking about how climate change affects us here and now in the places where we live, and talking about creative, constructive, positive solutions that are being implemented today or could be in the future. And of course, who's the number one person who can talk about it? You. The news media has an unprecedented platform to tell people the stories that we need to hear, the stories that will change our minds, the stories that will inspire us to act, ultimately, the stories that will change the world. We'll have more remarkable winning stories in a moment, but first, a word on covering climate now. This organization was founded in 2019 by the Columbia Journalism Review and The Nation magazine to break the climate silence that pervaded so much of the media. Since then, Covering Climate Now has grown to more than 400 news outlets, reaching some 2 billion people. These awards honor journalistic excellence and encourage newsrooms everywhere to up their game on the defining story of our time. That's right, some of the most powerful stories recognized here offer searing and heartbreaking accounts of individuals struggling to adapt to the relentless climate emergency. Our next winner offers profound glimpses of the human cost of climate change, along with resilience and sometimes hope. This story is so big and it's on every continent in every city on Earth and it in fact, it affects every human being on the planet. The work that's been done for Covering Climate Now, that has received these awards, showing the impact now as people face drought, fire, extreme weather linked to climate crisis, has extraordinary impact. It's an in-depth conversation. Locals interviewing locals, giving us an inside perspective on life in the Arctic. The winning entry in our audio radio category, Alaska Natives on the Front Line. This collaboration from Jenna Coons and Alex Kunik Glenn is a series of conversations with the indigenous community of Utkavik, Alaska. It was part of America that you don't often hear about. And it wasn't done by outsiders going in and telling you about Alaska. It was about people who live in the community, who know that community really well. You are actually the winners of the award. <laughs> Wow, Alice! 
Wow, I'm like, I might cry. I feel so emotional for some yeah, reason. Yeah, my heart is palpitating. That is a really, that's incredible. It was really important to me that I approach this project in a really intentional way and and a thoughtful way because it's not just a dot on a map. It's, you know, my hometown. I mean, you think about this last fall whaling, um, for whatever reason, the whales weren't there. The guys went out 30 or 40 times with their boats and we only got one whale for the whole community, so it's still not easy. Alice and I came across this reporting that looked at the way that uh, climate change is talked about in major media outlets. And it's often a reporter that's like, we call a parachute reporter that comes in for a short amount of time and doesn't know the community that reports on it in the language they use. It's often language of loss, you know, cultural extinction, language extinction, all of these really brutal um, words with negative connotations. And Alice and I wanted to avoid that and, and really wanted to just hand the mic to the people that are most impacted by it and see what they had to say. This is the first time I ever heard that our, our cellar, our cellar's um, over 100 years old, and I, I don't remember it ever thawing out like you did this last summer. Um, but we had caught it just in time, so nothing had spoiled. A reality we often forget is that the climate crisis impacts communities of color first. And so that was what was you particularly unique about this piece, is that it not only told us climate crisis is real, it's coming, it's here, but it showed us the communities who are feeling that day-to-day -day impact um, on their economy, on their food, on their livelihoods, on their safety. One of the very heartening aspects of that story uh, that comes through is that these people do not see themselves just as victims, uh, although you could argue that they are, but they are focused on solving the problem. Living in the Arctic is not easy, um, and but with, you know, with that, hardship comes ingenuity. Everyone had the same sentiment of like, we're here, we've always been here, and we're always going to be here. That's like something that I know as an Inupiaq woman, um, and that's what I really wanted to share. I hope that reporters and people continue to highlight innovative solutions with the problems. I think that's a big thing is solutions journalism and opening the door to not just saying, oh wow, look at this community that is gonna fall into the ocean, but saying like, look at, how they're funding a seawall to prevent that from happening. A powerful photo cuts through the noise. You empathize with the person who's in a situation very different to your own. You see what's happening in a different part of the world, what's happening in someone else's life things that you will probably never happen to you, but they help you to understand. Taking his camera to coastal and riverside communities in Bangladesh, Zakir Hossein Chowdhury captured intimate moments of struggle and resilience, creating what our judges called individually compelling images that document the impact of rising sea levels on a community. Chowdhury's images for the new humanitarian magazine earned him this year's award in the photography category. This is Bangladesh's Hidden Climate Costs. The entry Bangladesh's Hidden Climate Costs really stood out to us um, because it offered a first-hand look and account of the impact of rising sea levels on a specific community. So Bangladesh is a vulnerable condition. Some studies say that some of Bangladesh's low and coastal area will lose for climate change. This issue is very important for me to save my country from upcoming disaster. I think Zakir's work constantly shows uh, the day-to-day -day impacts of it. It's not just about um, you know displacement. It's not just about losing your home. It, you know these these impacts go on for for weeks and months and and years as as, photo, as his photographs showed. For me, what stood out about the photos in particular was the eyes of the subjects. It really showed the shock and the pain and the reality of what they were facing. There are a couple of photos which really put you in the middle of what's going on. There's one image where there are some men um, in the foreground, close to the camera, who are piling up sandbags. And behind them are other men up to their waists in water. And you can see um, just how hard this community is having to fight in order to maintain their homes. It's heartbreaking. The sandbags and embankments are all that protect this particular village from from some of the inundation, but you know, realistically, those are those should be a fairly temporary measure as far as disaster risk reduction goes. But for these particular people, that's you know that's what they can count on for now. 
just think for a while that they are very innocent. Those people are really don't know how they will go in their near future after lost their home. Next, a three-part series that combined data journalism with compelling storytelling. The winner in our special coverage category, The Great Climate Migration, A Warming Planet and a Shifting Population. This uh, climate uh, migration story is uh, uh, an outstanding investigative and data journalism piece about the local and global impact of climate warming on people. And it really gives a sense to what the world could look like tomorrow. The project was a partnership between ProPublica and the New York Times, led by reporter Abram Lusgarten. The Great Climate Migration was a phenomenal, astonishing piece of data work. But what they did so very well was to humanize, to localize, to take it to the ground level, to take it into little towns, little farms, little communities and explain where this is happening and why these models that they created seem all very real and very likely in so many ways. We see this incredible use of data to illustrate the way in which uh, people migrate uh, as a result of climate change and it's, it's illustrated visually in a way that you can easily, easily grasp. And that's integrated with a more traditional narrative, you know, written storytelling, which uses sort of typical ways of grabbing readers. The model tries to account for some of the complex uh, factors that go into people deciding to move and migrate, economic factors and family and safety and then climate on top of that. Um, but it suggests, you know, approximately 30 million additional people coming to the United States as the climate warms and, uh, you know, five to seven mil uh, million of those people being uh, exclusively driven by climate. Early in 2019, a year before the world shut its borders completely, Jorge knew he had to get out of Guatemala. The land was turning against him. Soon, he made a last desperate bet, signing away the tin roof hut where he lived with his wife and three children against a $1,500 advance in ochre seed. But after the flood, the rain stopped again, and everything died. Jorge knew then that if he didn't get out of Guatemala, his family might die too. By the time um, the families I was talking to were thinking about moving uh, or taking the extraordinary risk of, uh, you know, of trying to uh, to migrate to the United States or to Mexico, um, they were just, uh, you know, facing sheer desperation, um, re the real risk of, of starvation, um, the real risk of, you know, of someone in their family dying. Um, and that was just a depth of, of suffering uh, and immediacy uh, that I hadn't quite, you know, wrapped my head around at the start of my reporting. The idea also that you get this story out of Central America and then you just have the next story in the US and you understand that the climate change will touch everyone. I mean, even the people who feel that they are safe in their country where um, they have a good way of life, they will also uh, be impacted by the climate change. There is likely to be increasing border conflict, increasing tension between local governments, uh, increasing changes in trade that might be unfavorable to one side or the other that again leads to, to new conflict. And so by the time you reach conflict, it's, it can be hard to realize that at the beginning of that process was, you know, was increasing heat and decreasing crop yields, but, um, but it's that climate factor that is amplifying uh, the threat from the very beginning. Hello, my name is Vanessa Nakate. I am a climate justice activist from Kampala, Uganda, a country with one of the fastest changing climates in the world, a country suffering the most brutal impacts of the climate crisis already. These impacts, however, are a story that the world's media has largely failed to cover. The media has a historic responsibility to convey the truth about the climate crisis. This, of course, means reporting on the science, on activism, and on the politics. But it also means so much more. Most importantly, it means reporting on the climate devastation already taking place in communities like mine. Thank you.
At just 24 years old, Vanessa Nakate has become a powerful global voice, tying climate change to its impact on poverty, hunger, disease, and violence against women. It seems younger people tend to view the climate story with much more urgency because it's a story about their future, a story many say they should help write. It's so important for young people to be a part of the climate story and narrative now. They've been dealing with these blazes and trying to get these fires under control. This is where the flooding level was during Hurricane Irma. It's also really important that in all of the coverage we're doing, we're not just referencing young people or the planet that they're going to inherit, but that we're actually including their voices in the conversation. I think that there is a kind of urgency about their coverage, a kind of toughness that older journalists sometimes don't have. It's critical to include younger voices in journalism because they're the next generation and they're the ones who are feeling the weight of extinction. They understand that it is their personal future that we are talking about. They inherently get the issues of racial, national, and economic equity that are threaded through the whole issue of climate adaptation and mitigation and impacts. Research shows that younger audiences in particular want more climate news. At Now This, we've seen that about 68% of our audiences are engaged in some form of climate action in their communities. And so I think that's a key difference between the younger demographic, millennials and Gen Z and other generations, is that for them, it's not just a matter of, okay, what's the problem, but what can I do about it? So that's why you see places like Now This, you see places like Vox, you see places like BuzzFeed, which skew towards a younger audience. They were earlier on in amping up their climate coverage. And they've created shows like One Small Step from Now This, hosted by the young journalist Lucy Biggers. I'm on a mission to find out how my old food gets turned into compost. She's just one of many young climate journalists making a difference today. Or the new Al Jazeera show, Generation Change. Broadening our perspective on climate change and how policy making takes place in different areas around the world. It's very important to get those younger voices into our coverage and involves younger generation people who deal with issues that are particularly galvanizing the younger generation. There's no way to ignore the power of a new generation's commitment to this critical issue. And we saw it in covering Climate Now Wars. Uh, we reviewed so many interests for young journalists and, and it was just refreshing and really left us with a feeling of hope to see the, the amazing job that they were doing. This year, Covering Climate Now is honoring a journalist who exemplifies the passion, skills, and outlook young reporters bring to the climate story with our Emerging Journalist Award. The inaugural winner of this award is Rachma Dia. You're the winner. Really? <laughs> You're the winner. You're the 2021 Emerging Journalist. You won. Thank you. I feel very proud. Thank you. First, I'd just love to hear from you about why it is that you've decided to really focus your incredible skill set as a journalist on climate issues. Because I have a real interest in the environmental issues as a human being, not as a journalist. Uh, and in the second, uh, there is no many journalists uh, that care about uh, climate issues in our region and in my country. We have to know how to present our stories in a human way and in attractive way to uh, catch the attention of the people. This is our main job as a climate journalist. Rachma is an Egypt-based freelance reporter who has investigated stories like industrial oil pollution, the reasons for water shortages, and the climate implications of growing cotton. She's a great example of someone who's covering the climate crisis in a corner of the world that we don't hear much about. Covering climate um, in developing countries is really difficult. There's not a whole lot of support. It's often difficult to get access and information. And she's done such a breadth of stories from writing about Egypt's coral reefs to the plight of its farmers. Tell me about what you've seen in your country about how climate change has affected people's health and, and the things that you've really just seen with your own eyes. We started to uh, see the effects of climate change on the coral reefs in Egypt, how it's uh, badly affected with uh, climate change and uh, 
Uh, also the human activities, unfortunately. Also, uh, we have a, a main problem in Egypt in the water. We have all these uh, problems and affairs that related to climate change that we have to quickly adopt to climate change by uh, many ways in order not to uh, face a big problems in the near future. What's it been like for you to report on climate change in Egypt what challenges have you faced? There was a challenge in find the platform that has the ability to publish my stories. And during making the stories, I found also challenges to convince people to talk. For example, when I make stories about the cement factories that use coal in the industry, and the people in the surrounding area suffer from chest disease and cancers, uh, and many harmful effects. The people still afraid to talk to uh, the media. I worked on this story, on this investigative report, for a whole year. So they know that I am not pretending that I am cared. Now that you did get those people to trust you and you have written these stories, what's the reaction been like there? One of the, uh, the reactions that I felt my, my effort had paid off when uh, one of these factories I uh, told you about it was closed by court order after publishing my report. So I, I felt that we, we made something, we helped the people uh, in some way. Absolutely. Hey Rachma, you're the 2021 emerging journalist. Don't forget it. Is there anything else that you want to say about this award and honor that you so totally deserve? Thank you. I feel very proud and I feel that all the efforts that I made during the past years have paid off. So thank you for choosing me. <laughs> Rachma's expose of increased cancers near local factories actually helped close one of those factories. It's a stirring example of journalism's ability to hold power accountable and spark real change. Absolutely. In fact, many of this year's entries featured impressive in-depth investigations. Here now are winners. The U.S. electricity grid is abstract and complex. But relentless reporting turned a story full of technical detail into what the judges called powerful journalism that broke news and led to change. The winning entry in investigative journalism is Who Killed the Supergrid? by Peter Fairley for Investigate West and The Atlantic Magazine. When I became aware that um, there was important research at the national labs that was being bottled up, by the Trump administration, by political considerations. It was just, you know, enraging that this important research that taxpayers had funded was being squelched. Bringing this kind of thing to light is, you know, it, it's incredibly difficult as a journalist to write about this kind of thing and to find the kind of language to tell this kind of story and make people care about it. This is another great example of, of holding power to account of journalists who are digging, digging into the weeds in these things and uncovering details because there's a lot of self-interest with a lot of big corporations, industries, lobby groups, power groups. The SEAMS study by DOE's National Renewable Energy Lab set out to determine whether uniting America's big grids would pay. And the study's results bore that hypothesis out. But Trump appointee Katie Jeriza's email put the study in trouble. And the $1.6 million study itself disappeared. One of the biggest um, opportunities for addressing climate change is to decarbonize the power system. So it's something that has to happen. And one of the many stories where somebody or a group of people in the Trump administration welched the science, rejected something that would pay for itself, that would be in the national security, in the financial, in the environmental interests of the country. We immediately had impact through the House Science Committee. The Secretary of Energy wrote letters demanding answers. There was an amendment to a bill that demanded that the study be released. Once people saw that story run, they saw that change was possible. 
The next winning entry investigates how the oil industry shaped modern marketing and propaganda to subvert science. The Mad Men by Amy Westervelt for the podcast Drilled lays out 100 years of manipulation, misinformation, and public perception and wins in the audio radio category. What Amy did was go back and find out the role of big oil over a hundred years, how it has tried to manipulate the public. So fossil fuel industry organizations fund these fake front groups and they give these fake front groups these names that sound, they're like perfectly innocuous names like the California Drivers Alliance. So it's fake activism, it's corporate money posing as activism and it's designed to undo all of the progress that real activism makes. When I first started Drilled, I um, I tried to pitch it to a bunch of different podcast companies and they all told me that there was no audience for a climate podcast. And so I made it on my own because I was convinced that there was, you know? And the more I started looking into it, the more I realized that PR techniques for oil and tobacco really evolved alongside each other all along the way from, you know, the late 1800s to now. She links all the way through the way that Big Oil has hired people to lie. It's as simple as that. What is so powerful about this series is that it, it kind of ties all this history together to our present moment. It goes beyond our easy understanding of, yes, the oil industry, uh, big oil has sort of subverted science, and really gone back and showed how big oil invented fake news and invented the whole idea of, of public relations campaigns and of spin. It's useful to see that these things are not new. Like, they've been around for a long time, and I think if we can get a better understanding of why these strategies came about and how and what the thinking was behind them, then we can diffuse them. Our next entry looked in the mirror, reminding journalists of their own biases when covering the climate story. Winning in the commentary category, Michelle Garcia's probing essay for The Nation magazine, The Media Isn't Ready to Cover Climate Apartheid. Climate apartheid is a phrase that comes out of the United Nations report that looks at the truism that climate change in general hits the poor and people of color around this world first and worst. Once I started thinking about a climate apartheid framework, I began looking at stories through an entirely different lens. I began thinking about how are we going to confront a global worldwide crisis through a lens that is not based on, as I wrote in my piece, the worldview of a relatively wealthy white middle class, upper middle class. Neglecting certain groups of people signals that they are unimportant, an erasure that media scholars call symbolic annihilation. This became especially obvious with the pandemic, when seemingly overnight, the least paid and most exploited workers were rebranded essential workers. It was brilliant that she connected it to the way that the media had covered COVID and how much people just missed why communities of color were being impacted hardest by, by this virus. The COVID story has hit on the same themes as what we're gonna be seeing with the climate emergency. The rich and poor gap has been there for both stories. I think COVID has been very helpful in helping people frame how to think about the climate story. If we're not able to identify the structural inequalities, inequities in this pandemic, this was a wake-up call for what is to come and what is happening already with the climate crisis. This entry takes us to Brazil, where the Amazon rainforest hangs in the balance and humanity's climate future along with it. Jake Spring's aggressive, fast-paced reporting exposed the Brazilian government's loosening of deforestation regulations. Spring's work for the Reuters news agency is the winner in the breaking news category.
President Bolsonaro is, is a bit of a climate pariah, as we know, and doesn't recognize the urgency and the importance of it. And the articles uncovered that the Brazilian authorities, under the guise of the COVID-19 pandemic, was, was reversing and rolling back some of these uh, environmental protection me measures for the rainforest and the incredible danger and effect that this was potentially going to have. What the series did also is show the implications for the rest of the world. The loss of biodiversity, the loss of, of carbon sink, the extra emissions, you know, the damage done by this you know, just huge scale of, of deforestation, um, you know, will, will echo in the climate signature for decades. It happened really quickly too. There was a huge increase in deforestation in a very short time. And so it was crucial to investigate what was happening and to report it very quickly and to stay on it. We had a governmental source admit to the rollback of certain environmental protection measures. It had ramifications uh, within Brazil itself and internationally as well. You actually are the winner of the Covering Climate Awards. Wow. This year. Wow. Congratulations. I, I can't believe it, honestly. Wow. That's crazy. It's just a huge honor to hear that, you know, that body of work is being recognized. So the number one thing that the Bolsonaro government has done is they have weakened environmental enforcement. For my reporting in 2020, it was just kind of another uh, tightening of the screws. The pandemic, they used that to roll back environmental enforcement by another third. One thing I had recognized is that the current Bolsonaro government did not respond at all to uh, criticisms from foreign governments, from NGOs at all. The one thing I noticed that they did listen to were businesses and investors. I found many that, that were willing to go on record saying they would divest from Brazil if things continue to worsen. And that really, I mean, within a couple of weeks, the government called in these very same investors to meet with them to try to reassure them that they were taking action. It is extraordinarily encouraging to see how many courageous, fearless, independent-minded journalists have decided the climate story is theirs. That is how change has come about, to expose villains, to expose money flow, to expose corporate malfeasance, and it is media malpractice not to hold a powerful account. Climate change is a massive story that can sometimes feel daunting, but some of the winning entries took on that challenge of outlining the big picture and revealing surprising consequences for humans and ecosystems alike. Take a look. Our next winner is a cinematic narrative detailing how rising temperatures don't just melt ice and wither crops. They also invite invasions of disease-carrying mosquitoes. The winner in the features category, How Climate Change is Ushering in a New Pandemic Era, by Jeff Goodell for Rolling Stone magazine. One of the powerful things that we have to do in journalism is tell the whole story. And I think what Jeff did here is he laid out a problem that maybe very few people outside of science, outside of virologists, outside of science journalism, really understood how profoundly frightening it is. When you start thinking about sea level rise and climate change more broadly, one of the things that you, know, you understand very quickly is that it's gonna force people to move. The animals that carry diseases, we've been fighting for generations, things like mosquitoes and ticks and bats are also moving. And as those creatures move, they're carrying those diseases with them. The confluence of thinking about migration from sea level rise and the, and the beginnings of COVID really made me think more deeply about the consequences. A compelling element of the Goodell piece as well is that it gets down to this tiny little organism that, you know, we don't necessarily think about uh, when we're thinking about the sort of big macro climate changes. You know, he catches you right in the beginning. Um, the lead where he describes how a mosquito extracts blood from you, I think was the most meticulous um, examination of what happens when a mosquito does do that. First, it spit on Jones's skin to numb it so she wouldn't be alerted to the bite. Then it plunged its syringe-like proboscis, which is actually a sheath containing six needles into Jones's skin. And here is the important part. As it sucked out the blood, the mosquito spit its own saliva into Jones's vein, which contains an anticoagulant that prevents the blood from clotting at the puncture site. In this case, it also contained a virus that caused a tropical disease called dengue fever. 
His focus on the ability to connect the viruses that we're seeing, the illnesses that we're seeing to climate change was very strong and very profound. I think it's really uh, important as a journalist covering the climate crisis to really try to get the scale of what we're talking about into our stories somehow. That's what I'm trying to do, is fight off a big chunk of the story and really tell as best I can the sort of grand consequences of what we're doing as we heat up the planet. Another winning entry was two years in the making, filmed all across the United States. A CNN team pursued weekly stories while simultaneously building a larger narrative that became our winner in the video TV category. This is Road to Change. We're committed to about a foot, maybe a foot and a half of sea level rise here. And by the end of the century, by 2100? By the, by the end of 2100, it could be anywhere between three and six feet. Some of your colleagues, they're predicting 15 feet of sea sure. level rise, which means Miami's gone, right? Yes, 15 feet and is a serious problem. The CNN piece, The Road to Change, the instant I saw that, I knew it was a classic. It's one of the two or three best pieces of climate journalism that's ever been done. Bill Weir managed to take you through the entire history of this issue while also humanizing it. Just a brilliant combination of visual storytelling and strong point of view that was never less than factually rigorous. There was no stopping the Industrial Revolution. Coal and oil transformed humanity, built the modern world, complete with overseas highways. But all that burning also built an invisible greenhouse in the sky. You guys have won the Covering Climate Now awards. What? <laughs> Amazing. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Wow. wow. One of the, the job or the assignment that we were given was to think about the country and the future of when climate change you know, would arrive here in the U.S. And so we wanted to try and capture for the public what it might look like here at home. And very quickly, we realized that we didn't have to look into the future and that climate change was, of course, um, already here and impacting people's lives in, in a lot of ways. I'm checking cattle with snow blowing into my face and I come around the corner and I'm hearing the, the frogs chirping in a snow blizzard. It was just weird. I'm like, this is what climate change is. What made this project especially poignant and, and personal is I had a baby boy um, just a few weeks before it aired, actually. The first time I saw his face, his little ultrasound face, I went from the doctor's office to interview Greta Thunberg. And so just to think about how he has to think about the world and every sort of staple of food and water and shelter, uh, how those calculations change in this new normal, it made it very, very personal. Bill Weir is now CNN's chief climate correspondent. Eventually, he says, all journalists on every beat will be climate journalists. It's politics, geopolitics, it's the economy, it's healthcare, it's food production, it's transportation, it's history, it's psychology. All of that is, is wrapped into this story and there's so many layers. This is the story of our times and we have got to treat it like the emergency that scientists say it is. Now is the moment. If we don't get this story right, if we don't really grapple with the climate emergency, we are not going to be around to, to cover other stories. Now, as these award-winning stories show, so many newsrooms are tackling the climate story, giving audiences the information they need to understand both the crisis and its solutions. And in November, world leaders will gather in Glasgow, Scotland, for a UN climate summit, COP26, a final chance to diffuse the climate emergency and preserve a livable planet. Well, over the past year and a half, journalists have risen to the challenge of the COVID-19 emergency with coverage that prioritized science over politics, never losing sight of the human cost and courage involved. Now, can newsrooms show that same focus on the climate emergency? We hope these award-winning stories inspire journalists everywhere to cover the climate story like our lives dependent on it. 
because they do. <laughs> now, if you want to learn more about these awards, the work of Covering Climate Now, or maybe apply for next year's awards, go to CoveringClimateNow.org. Thanks so much for joining us for the 2021 Covering Climate Now Awards. And so fun to be part of the inaugural one. That's right. Have a great night. Bye-bye.